Welcome to Taking the Helm with Lynn McLaughlin. In this ever-changing world, it's essential to prioritize our children's emotional well-being. Lynn can show you how to learn and model healthy emotional habits for your loved ones and become a rock-solid support system for your family. Now, here's your host. Welcome, everyone, to our first episode on Voice America. I'm Lynn McLaughlin, and I've been hosting this podcast, Taking the Helm, for over three years. But my team and I are beyond excited today to be joining you uh, in this new broadcast studio. So bear with us. It's our first episode. Uh, What's this show all about anyway? Why are we here? Well, it all started one day when I was out for a walk. And I don't know about you, but that's something that keeps me sane. And after 30 years in the business of education and supporting family members who were in the depths of anxiety, I had one of those aha moments. Let me ask you a question, which I think we can all relate to. Do you wait until something feels off or you notice an odd symptom before you make an appointment or seek support for your physical or your mental health? It's what we've all been taught to do, isn't it? Don't we have it backwards? That was my aha moment. Now we're on a quest to move us into the proactive engagement mindset instead of reactive responses, specifically around our emotional well-being. Now, don't get me wrong. We need to think outside of the box with supports and services like never before. But what if? What if we learn the tools and strategies from around the world that we know work to model for our children and our students and create a calmer, more conscious, driven minds in our children in this crazy world? Is it possible? It sure is. I'm thrilled to be bringing voices to you who have the answers, and collectively, we can make this happen. We're on a mission to empower children, helping them discover those stepping stones, but it all starts with us. Let's cultivate that confidence, empathy, and self-awareness in our kids so they can manage those big emotions in a positive way for life. I thought I'd just share a few things about me because you don't know anything about me before we start, uh, before I introduce our first awe-inspiring guest. I've been an educator for over 35 years, and I served in a lot of roles from all the way from kindergarten and now in post-secondary, a program consultant, school principal, and systems superintendent. I've seen education from a number of perspectives and most definitely seen and supported struggling students. Uh, One year after being in the role of a superintendent, I was blindsided and diagnosed with a brain tumor. But good news here, great news, I am so blessed. I'm about to celebrate my 10-year craniversary. Yes, that's the word we use, (laughs) a craniversary. And I count those blessings every single day. I know now that that time in my life gave me a reset, which I desperately needed. And our guest was by my side when I went through that. Uh, Last but not least, my husband and I are proud parents of three children. They're now all in their 20s. And here's a little trivia question for you. I'm coming to you from the most southern town in Canada. And here's another hint. We're parallel to San Francisco. I'll tell you the answer at the end of the show. (laughs) It's my honor to introduce our first guest, Annette Ebbinghaus. She is a globally sought after mental fitness resilience coach, a master sophrologist, a motivational speaker and author, and she draws from over 30 years of experience She's the founder of the Be Chill Exams and Life Programs for Adolescents and Young Adults. And her ethos is, and I love this, Annette, the first wealth is health. Let's ingrain that into our minds. Physical, emotional, and spiritual health are the cornerstones of her her work. Annette is a dear friend and has been educated in several fields, beginning her professional career as a civil engineer building bridges in Canada. She now builds bridges between the mind, body, and consciousness. Welcome, Annette, and thank you for joining us today on Voice America. Thank you, Lynn. It's a true pleasure to be here. Um, You you inspire me the way you went through um, your life-changing moment, and um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here helping you. And not only did you inspire me in that moment, but what you went on to do after that with the books for children, how to manage their emotions. You have such passion in the work that you do. And and even as a teacher, um, a school administrator, honestly, you've probably helped more children than uh, anybody I know. So thank you for doing that. 
Well, how very kind of you. When we talk about life experiences, I think we need about five hours to even just touch on the things that you've gone through in your life too, Annette. And I'm just thrilled to have you with us. So how about we start out by, um, is there a personal experience or a key, key moments that sparked your interest in children and youth mental health that's leading you to this amazing work that you're doing today? Something come to mind? Well, it's kind of interesting. So, um, as you said, I was an engineer and I did an MBA and I was working in sustainable development. I kind of moved around the world. I had been in Switzerland and then um, moved to Singapore. And I'd been married for 12 years without children. So when I was in Singapore, finally, my husband and I decided we'd have kids. And actually, that's the moment that life sort of changed. And, and it's not because we had children per se, but it's because I had a fear of heights. And we were moving into this penthouse apartment in or condo in Singapore. And I was so afraid. I thought, oh my goodness, I'm not gonna be able to live in this place. And so my sister had said to me, hey, you know, you should see this, this woman. She's a clairvoyant, a hypnosis and NLP practitioner. Like she's one of the best in the world, blah, blah, blah. And I happened to be going back home. So I was in Toronto and um, I went to see her. And when I see her, she says to me, oh, um, she said, you're about to have children. She goes, you have got to start dealing with all of your childhood issues so that you don't bring this upon your own children. And I'm looking at her like, what are you talking about? But it's true. I mean, I had things as a child. I mean, as we as we all do, and I'm one of six. So, and we were all very close together, 11 months, 13 months apart. So imagine you've got six kids all vying for the parents' love, you know? So there are, it's, it's, um, each child perceives things differently because they all are in a different <clears throat> sort of number along the line, right? With, with their parents. And then there were just other things that happened as well. So, you know, I realized, okay, I've got to do something because I wanted to parent. I liked, I love my parents and the way they parented was the best that they could parent. So it's like, now how can I take that and parent even better? Right? So that started my journey. And I would say that, you know, it's it's not a four-year or three-year journey. It, it's a 20-year journey. You know, it takes time to actually peel back all the layers of things that happen to you in your life um, and deal with them. Because all of these things, they, they develop um, fears, doubts. Um, and yes, they can lead to some mental illness as well, some depression, some deep depressions. It can also just lead to um, a lot of anger, um, sort of violent behaviors as well. So there's lots of things, you know, that we need to deal with before we actually have our own children so that we don't then pass it on to them. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what got me started on this body-mind journey. Yes, our environment and experience before the age of five or six, right, stays with us and shapes our views. And let's jump in because uh, you and I have something very common. Let's talk about self-sabotaging traits that we have both oh, discovered yeah. were formed in both of our lives uh, when we were children. <laughs> yeah, no, this is quite interesting. So um, yeah, because I have these five keys for parents. And the first one is, you know, really be paying attention to the environment and experiences um, that your children have before the age of five or six. So when we talk about that, when in early life is when these sort of self-sabotaging traits sort of develop, all right? And they develop because of the environment and the experiences. So it's what your parents say, teach say, care, say, how you're treated. And we can call these kind of traits, they're saboteur traits. We call them mm. the, the things that sabotage our success, our happiness, our mental health. And they're the voices in the head that kind of generate all the stress and negative emotions in the way that we handle our parenting and life challenges. So they live actually in the limbic system of the brain um, and the, the brain stems and parts of the left brain. And the limbic system is what we call the crossroads of emotions. Okay. So the very much wired into the subconscious mind as well, okay? And they produce most of our stress, anxiety, that self-doubt, anger, shame, guilt, frustration, all that mind chatter that never stops, all right? They're the sabotage, the saboteurs. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I talked earlier, um, I think you had mentioned you had a controlling nature, is that right, Lynn? <laughs> oh, yes. And it took a lot of work to figure out why, but I sure know now. <laughs> I wish I had discovered yes. it earlier in my life <laughs> because it's affected yeah. well, my relationships uh, with my children in not always positive ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I had that too. I really wanted to be in control of my environment. Now I think it becomes, I was three of six. 
So, you know, we didn't have a lot of choice. And so I wanted to control my environment as best as I could control to keep myself safe, right? So the controller, it's kind of interesting. We believe controllers anyway, that without controlling everything around us, we will not get things done. So that means we can be impatient with our um, with others, uh, especially not really being concerned too much with their feelings or their different styles. Um, and we're either kind of always in control or out of control. We don't believe there's anything in between, right? And that if we work hard enough, we can control things so that everything goes our way. And this usually produces high anxiety when things are not going our way. And so from a parenting perspective, what this does is this costs our this it's like a cost to our children is that they always feel they're being controlled and that can cause resentment because we mm -hmm. don't allow them to tap into their own reserves and it doesn't really support them in their growth for self-worth and self-reliance mm -hmm. so it can create a lot of anxiety in kids so dealing with your controlling nature before you have children or at least if you know you are it's like okay i know i am I now need to do something about it because you don't want to be that controlling parent. And my reason, as I I went, to, I I had to go to counseling to figure this out because a uh, relationship with one of my children was uh, was not was combative. I'll just the, use the word combative because I, as you said, Annette, I wanted her to do things the way I wanted them done. Right? Uh, sorry, it doesn't work that way with teenagers. Uh, and when I went back to my childhood, the reason I'm a control freak, one of the big reasons is. From the age of nine, I'm, I'm the oldest of four, right? I'm the ages, and I have two half brothers, but of course they weren't uh, with me when I was a young child, when I was younger. From the age of nine, my father was a musician traveling on the road and was gone from the house for longer and longer and longer periods of time. I became, I believe the word is parentific parentification is the word that I'm hearing today where, you know, I helped my mom out. I was the oldest, I, you know, all those kinds of things. And and I think my need to control back then was it just was it just became part of who I was. And it took a lot to unpack that and to be able able to learn to ask open ed questions and and put responsibility back on my kids and say, well, what do you think? It's supposed to be saying, I think this. Right. And it's oh, the relationship is so much better today. It's absolutely beautiful. But I you know, I was a big part of that combative relationship because I wasn't aware. Yeah, well, the amazing thing, Lynn, is that you figured it out. A lot of parents just don't figure it out, mm. you know, and then, you know, they have this sort of relationship with their teenager, the teenager goes off to university, perhaps college or something, maybe they move away from home. And it kind of can drive a wedge between you and your child. And it needs something, it's something that needs to be resolved. But really, the resolution, it, it's important to resolve between you and your child, but it's really within the self. Mm -hmm. So we have to do the work on ourselves. And it's recognized recognizing what saboteurs we have. So I'll, I'll just list, there's nine of them. Okay, so we have oh. not, there's nine main saboteurs. And the, the really big one, though, is the judge. And everyone has the judge. And the judge is really not easy to shake. It's kind of the master saboteur. And this one is the one that's always telling us we're not good enough, we're not fast enough, we're not smart enough. It warns us um, to obsess about our future. It wakes us up at night to worry. It's fixated on what is wrong uh, with other people or what's wrong in our life it's it's not supportive it really tries to keep us safe but it does it in a really negative way it has a direct link to the stress side of the of the nervous system so if we think about all the different saboteurs we've got uh there so, so the judge is the main one but we have the controller we have the stickler we have the hyper vigilant there's the hyper rational there's the pleaser there's the victim so there's a lot of these I mean, they're very negative terms. But these terms are super important because it's sort of, it's your, it could be a positive characteristic, but as a saboteur, they're in overdrive. Mm -hmm. And when they're in overdrive, it becomes a problem. Okay. And we learn, it's really important for us to learn how to intercept those saboteurs. Okay. Name them, talk them off the ledge sort of thing. And then also how to change the behavior. So what's the behavior I want instead? And we, we talk about that as being sage. So how can I access my sage more? How can I access my sage power? So when something goes wrong, can I see the gift in it? That's sort of the sage perspective is finding the oh, gift in things that. that go wrong. Oh. Yeah. And then those sage powers, you know, how can I have um, empathy? 
um, the exploring power. What are the real facts in a disagreement? You know, because when we're in a disagreement, we're depending on what saboteur is at work at play, you don't hear the other person. Um, we have an innovate power. And innovate is about finding the 10% that you can agree with when someone's talking about something, because there's always 10% you can agree with. And yeah. then building on it. Okay. Yeah, that's really important to say these days because we seem to be in a, you know, you know, I have to get my opinion out. I have to get my opinion out. But when we actually listen with the intent of understanding, I couldn't agree with you more. 10% is not hard to find. <laughs> no. And then there's the navigate power, which is what we call flash forward. So it's visiting your older, wiser self. So it's what would I, as you're older, what would I say to my now self? And mm. that's actually a very powerful um, visualization and experience to, to do um it's sure especially is. when you have things with your kids you know it's what do I do now because sometimes we really don't know what to do but you do know and you know from within you just have to take time to to explore that and then there's activate and it's sort of what actions are you going to commit to how, how are you going to activate yourself to move forward so these are oh. sort of the different things we do and um I run some programs that specialize in this particular whole thing. It's their positive intelligence programs. And I like to work with parents because I think it's really important because, again, I, I do work with adults, but my passion is the adolescents and the parents of adolescents and children just to make everybody's lives a little bit simpler. Oh, we could just talk. We have several other things to talk about, but the list of saboteurs. I'm. I. I, I think my listeners would agree with me. There's two or three in there that, <laughs> that I could have said yes, absolutely. And and I think you're you're so correct. It's it, it's becoming con conscious and aware that this is happening, and then be able to act on it. All right. Well, we're about to no, take a short break, uh, Annette, and we're going to be coming back to talk about how we can manage stress and stress and uh, challenging situations childhood trauma it does not need to be a drastic catastrophic event but it does affect our children and um an interesting conversation you and i had about the words that we choose to use creates our reality <laughs> we'll be right back after this break Our children are growing up in a world that is more complex than ever. It's time to start thinking proactively. Meet Zerko and the children who glow in the color they are feeling because they haven't learned to control their emotions yet. In the Power of Thought Children's series, we're not only teaching children about emotional vocabulary, but how to recognize how they are feeling and what they can do about it. We live on an imaginary planet called Tezra, where every character is named after a crystal. Each of the five books in the series takes children into a situation they can relate to, but teaches problem-solving skills and evidence-based strategies they can use for life. This series was developed in collaboration with clinicians, educators, parents, and guardians, and it's the winner of the Mom's Choice Award. Check it out at lynnmclaughlin.com under the Books tab. Now, back to the show. I love the sound of those children's laugh laughter <laughs> in the book promo. Oh, thank you. They're good books too. Appreciate it. Okay, so let's jump uh, jump into children's subconscious. Their minds absorb everything around them in our environment. And you know, I said at the beginning, we as adults, how do we manage ourselves when we're feeling those emotions so that we can model properly for our children? Well, it's kind of interesting because um, you know, <laughs> when people start saying usually it would be my husband, you're just like your mother, you know, it really holds <laughs> true in a lot of cases, because what we do is we end up mirroring our parents behavior. Um, and we do actually have mirror neurons. So we mirror the behavior of people in front of us too. So if someone gets angry, you're more apt to get angry because of our mirror neurons. But no matter, um, it's when we're younger, we do develop sort of the, our strategies for managing stress or strategies for managing anger our strategies for or managing challenges, it's usually sort of mimics a little bit of how our parents did it. Now, there could be two different things, though. You could see your parent at one end of the extreme and you say, okay, forget it. I'm not going to be like that. So you end up pairing from the other end of the extreme. And really, we need to be parenting somewhere in the middle. It's kind of like the nervous system. We have the stress side, we have the peace side, but where we operate at our best is between the two. 
Not mm-hmm. all the way on the peace side. If you're on the peace side too much, you're just way too zen to get anything done, right? So <laughs> it's kind of like that too. You want to be on both sides. So I would say that, um, again, it goes back to the saboteurs. It's knowing yourself, having that self-awareness, and then doing something about it so that you don't pass those characteristics onto your children, okay? Because it's important. And I, it, it kind of segues into... Um, um, another thing, and it's sort of this whole loving unconditionally, because we want our children to be able to love people unconditionally. However, are we loving our children unconditionally is is a good question, you know, and brain studies have shown that unconditional love, it activates the brain's reward system. So it releases the endorphins that we associate with happiness, joy, and positive body sensations. So that it's, it's more than just the emotion. And that would be the dopamine and the oxytocin. So this unconditional love really improves emotional well-being, um, it creates better resilience, um, and kids usually have fewer mental health symptoms if they have experienced this unconditional love. Now, you know, it's not so easy sometimes um, because what happens is um, when I say, well, of course I love my child, and it's like, yes, I know you love your child. However, it's how do you show your love for your child? And Mm -hmm. sometimes we link things too much to performance. Okay. Agreed. So we reward them. Yeah. We reward them for good performance and we get really proud of them and that's all great, but it's, do we overdo it? Right. So young and young children, um, they really don't know the difference between people like withholding love or disapproval. They, they almost think that they're one in the same. Okay. That they are the same. So it's challenging because sometimes people just, they disapprove of their child too much and their child thinks I'm not lovable or I'm not loved. So it's how do you use love, you know, not to use it to threaten or control your child, right? Because that's that's not the way to go. So if we give this excessive praise, uh, physical affection, you know, lavish gifts for rewarding for successes, then when they fail... If they're punished when they fail, or we express a lot of disappointment when they fail, um, or we sort of neglect them when they fail or withhold their love, well, then we we create a big problem. And this sometimes you see with, um, I guess I've seen with kids, kids of uh, like that are really athletic, right? And the parents are really oh, pushing yes. them and everything. And you can see where if the kids fail, and I, I think and- Andrea... Andre Agassi had an issue with his father in that way. I think it was that. I'm not I'm not exactly sure, but it was something like that. Um, I think Tiger Woods maybe as well. I'm not sure. But you you do see that in in this way. So the thing is not to do that. Now, I was just working with a student yesterday, and it was really interesting because she's um she's got some math test exams coming up. And she was saying how when she doesn't do well on a math test, her father often says, well, when I was your age, I would get 95% or 90% on every single test. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, like that is a burden. And that is not showing unconditional love. Well, and that's certainly not a positive, having a positive effect on her self-esteem or (laughs) self-confidence or her ability to take risks and say, all right, I didn't do as well as I thought I would. I've got to learn something from this and move on. So yeah, you know, we got to yeah. catch ourselves when we're doing those kinds of things and just be if we like I said earlier, if we're aware, we can stop it from happening and change the the verbiage, change the feedback that we give. Well, it might not have worked yeah. that yeah. this time, but what can we do differently next time? Exactly. Yeah. And you know, um so my son he 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 was a is a good tennis player, but he played a lot of tennis when he was younger and we always took him to tournaments and things and when um when you're younger playing tennis there's no referees. So sometimes we'd be I'd be watching these tournaments and they could go all weekend long, but you're sitting there watching them play and maybe the other kid's cheating or something happens or they get angry. And I didn't really like to see my son get angry on the tennis court. So one day my son said to me, mom, you cannot have any expressions at all while you're watching me play tennis because I'm a very expressive person. And so I like, I get so excited and then that would make him nervous or I would get like, disappointed and I'd have this disappointed face. So I wasn't helping him. I wasn't helping him find his strength, right? I wasn't helping him with his own resilience and his own power because I was too expressive. So I would then sit there and I'm a sophrologist, so I have techniques. So I could sit there and be super calm when chaos was going on around me. Mm -hmm. And I had 
one parent one time come to me and she was saying, how can you not be more upset and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just looking at her and I'm thinking, oh my God, yes, you are the exact mother that I don't want to be on the tennis court, you know, sort of thing. So I really had to sit there and be very stoic, no matter what was going on while my son was on the tennis courts. And that wasn't an easy thing to do, but it was the right thing to do to support him to find his own way and his own strength. And, and that's not so simple for people to do. So, you know, you need to learn how to do these things. Um, well, I was just saying that. Sorry. Go ahead. It, taking on, we take, I mean, every parent feels this way, right? I mean, I think about my daughter in basketball, my son's in hockey. Okay. We take on that emotion and because we're feeling, we're, we think we're feeling the way they're feeling. And if they're feeling disappointed and you put it back on them, that it's not being helpful at all. It's actually having the opposite effect. I love the way that you yeah. explain this with your son's tennis. Yeah, no. And, you know, so there was, there's been heaps of studies on these things. And, you know, most of our listeners, they might know Carol Dweck, but her and Melissa Kamins, they, um, the University of Columbia, they had discovered that children who believed that their self-worth was dependent on how they performed were highly self-critical mm. and they showed really strong negative emotions. <laughs> yep. Really yeah. strong negative emotions. Um, they judged their performances severely. They demonstrated a lot less persistence when they had setbacks, you know, so kids raised in an, we call that an outcome love environment. You know, they can have some powerful dread of failure and anticipated loss of love from their parents if they fail. So that really creates kids who just don't want to try new things, right? They don't mm -hmm. want to put themselves out there. And as adolescents, you know, yourself, individuation, it's a time for them to take risk to try new things. Yes. Yes. And if we don't, I'm going to jump over to that piece. If we don't allow them to take tr risks and we're the control people, I'll go back to me being in the control people. What are we actually saying to them that we don't believe they have the skills? We don't believe they have the abilities. We don't think they can succeed because we have to take charge. Whereas, yes, it's hard. It's one of the hardest things we have to do as parents is watch our children fail, but it's when they get back up and take it as a learning lesson and move forward. That's the celebratory piece. And the, that builds their confidence because we've showed them in a nonverbal way, maybe that, yes, we believe in them and they can do it. Uh, yeah, I'm, exactly. I, I get very excited about, yeah. I get goosebumps when I talk about these things. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I yes, I, I understand it completely, you know, and, and there's, there's um, something else called dangling carrot love. Oh. And that's another thing to avoid. And it's sort of like, no matter how hard your child tries, um, the parent doesn't ever see them wholly. So, you know, you get 90, say you, you've worked yourself up to 75%. And okay, great. Next time you should get 80, you know, or then you get your uh, 85%. Okay, why didn't you get 90? Well, this is kind of like the situation with this, the student that I, that I was speaking with yesterday. So, you know, these children, they become strivers, and they're constantly end up chasing the next success, because in a way, they become a little bit hopeless because they're never really rewarded for their efforts at all, right? So would you say so, they're they're looking for external gratification? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because their parents are never satisfied. So they have to keep looking for something to satisfy themselves, but nothing ever satisfies them because mm. their parents were never satisfied. Yeah. I, I just want to jump in. I, I had an interview with a nine-year-old uh, last week, actually, a nine-year-old from my local area. And I asked her the question, what are kids your age uh, most concerned about? And right now it's report cards in, you know, report cards are coming up. And I said, oh, that's not for five weeks. What's going to happen if you get a grade that, you know, well, I'll just, then I know I didn't learn something properly and I'll, I'll have to go back and I'll ask for help and, and I'll try again. And I thought, well, can we listen to this young lady? How brilliant at the age of nine. <laughs> like, yes. I love it. She's got good parents. Oh, I love yes, it. That's yes, fantastic. they do. <laughs> and you know, Oh, it's it's interesting because love really is the most most powerful tool we have with our children. It really is to create healthy minds, you know, and we need to really participate in this unconditional love. And then there's also this like um, love based on values. So it's to really nurture the development of positive values and good moral behavior. So praising our kids when um, they demonstrate these values of respect, you know, responsibility, yes. effort, uh, having self-discipline, compassion, generosity because if we actually praise them for those things then that's what they're going to then want to do because they're very impressionable especially when mm -hmm. they're younger they're very impressionable and they really only know us we are their world and things get lodged in their subconscious mind based on how we love them so that's important and those are skills that ser will serve them well for life absolutely 
Absolutely. All right. Wow. Another big topic here. We got, uh, all right, childhood trauma. You and I have talked about this, my goodness. And I'm just going to share a little story, if you don't mind, Annette, at the beginning, because I've learned this. And yeah, these days we know that childhood trauma can occur at birth at very, very young ages. We know this now. It's grounded in research. When my kids were young, we did not know this. And one of my kids um, was, was ill as a child and actually later diagnosed with uh, childhood asthma and had a very, very, I'm going to use the word now, traumatic hospital experience. I'm told this doesn't happen anymore. I'm told that we have uh, people who are helping children. But basically, she was having a, an asthma attack, was transferred to a pediatric ward. I was half an hour late getting there because I had to follow the ambulance. Um, and by then, they wanted to put an IV in her and took her out of my arms into another room. And when she came back, her arm was taped off and blocked and the IV in was in and she was absolutely hysterical. I now know, and she wrote about that in a, in a, in a school paper, like, I don't know, it was a journal entry in grade two or three, like to remember it that vividly. I now know that that specific incident was, was definitely traumatic to her. And we can do things if we're aware now that this could be traumatic to my child. Let's take action at that age rather than waiting until we see those signs and symptoms, which I talked about at the beginning. So let's talk more about this, Annette. Yeah, no, that's actually a good example. Um, because, you know, there's um, statistics from the National Child Traumatic um, Stress Initiative in the U.S., and they say that two-thirds of children report at least one traumatic event by the age of 16. That's a shocking number. Sure and, you know, is. for them, th there's a lot of different things. I mean, there's some big things, you know, there could be, you know, school violence, community violence, you know, witnessing or experiencing domestic violence, uh, sex exploitation, violent loss of a, of a loved one or sudden loss of a loved one is equally traumatic, right? Mm -hmm. um, or experience military family related stressors. And there's the possible physical abuse, there's neglect, or then there's serious accidents or life-threatening illnesses. And life-threatening illness describing is something yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. So the list is pretty long, but you know, sometimes the trauma doesn't have to be um a huge trauma. So in in my case, um we were I was carjacked with my children in the car. We were living in the US at the time and my son was 14 months and my daughter was I think three and a half. And I tried to make it the nicest carjacking experience possible. <laughs> I was very calm, very cool, collected. However, when we finished and I finally, like the jacking was over and I, I got my kids back into the apartment, I then, you know, get on the phone to try to get my husband and I'm kind of freaking out. And then um, this, because we were carjacked in front of this apartment we were living in and um, the SWAT team comes to my front door and I open the door and these seven guys in full gear, you know, with guns ablazing and the whole packs and stuff <laughs> you're like oh, oh my god scary I mean, for was, you never mind your children so, <laughs> yeah it was and they come racing in wanting to know where this guy is it's like oh my god so yeah it was a bit overwhelming i thought oh my god get me out of here we had just moved from singapore to the u.s um i thought oh my goodness if this is what life is gonna be like here i just do not want to live here and um we also had the um we had just moved from Singapore and we had left really close friends behind because we had no family in Singapore. So your friends become really important because we're so far away from family. And we'd left um, a nanny that had been with us since the birth of both of my kids. And that was a huge trauma for them. It really was. We managed to get her over to the US eventually, but it was quite traumatic when we left because it was, you know, when would we ever see her again? We weren't really sure. Mm -hmm. So trauma really comes in in different forms. And it can also be, you know, if you have one parent who travels a lot or um, maybe works evenings and the child never really gets to see their father, they can feel a little bit like they're abandoned. Or maybe it's the mother, right, working in the hospital, whatever it is. Um, they can sometimes have abandonment issues as well, which you think, wow, how does all this happen? But it can it can happen, you know. But so let's say a four year old, we've we've realized there's been a traumatic incident. What can we do at that at such a young age, Annette, to support them? Well, there's all kinds of different um, therapies, really, that you can use with kids. And so art therapy is fantastic. There's also movement therapy as well. There's also um, equine. So working with horses yes. or animals, that seems to be really calming for kids too. You know, finding a good mindfulness practitioner as well and, and learning. You can even buy stacks of cards and do them yourself. But you as the parent need to have that demeanor. 
If you don't have that demeanor, then you've got to work on yourself in order to help your child. Yeah. Okay. So you've got to make sure that you're going to have that as well, right? Like how am mm -hmm. I handling myself in these situations? It matters. Yeah. Play, music therapy. Yeah. Something mm -hmm. to be thinking about again. And now we like to think we can protect our children. Let's talk about that. Well, okay. Yeah, it's interesting. So I'm going to go back to the story of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And um, the Buddha was born a prince and he lived amongst the palace walls and his parents refused to let him go out into the world. And one day he did get over those palace walls or through the door and he did go out into the world. And what he saw was a lot of suffering. And that's what actually caused him to go and sit under the tree and sit there there until he became enlightened because he couldn't handle the suffering that he saw because he didn't know any of this. And I think he was 18 when he left the palace walls, something like that. So he, his whole life had been in this bubble. So we can't really protect our kids from this. And this is, you referenced the Dalai Lama. So I had gone to, um, to see the Dalai Lama when he was here in Switzerland last. And one of the things that really struck me is when he said that we cannot know pleasure without knowing pain. Mm. And we cannot know pain without knowing pleasure. Because I was kind of of the mind that, can I like work with adolescents so that they never have to suffer? Like, can I create this world where, you know, they're all like, wow, well, have such great self-worth so they never have to suffer through the rest of life. But life just doesn't work that way. No. And it's like, okay, so I might not be able to prevent the pain, but I can certainly equip them with tools so that they know how to manage the pain, Right. So I, I found fact, it quite profound. The fact know? of life, the yin-yang, yeah. the light, dark, the good, bad, the stressors, they come. They're part of life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. And, you know, I can't um, imagine so what it would have been like to be in the presence of Dalai Lama, of the Dalai Lama. I, it was, oh, my goodness. It was, it was actually quite special, but it wasn't just me. It was me and like 5,000 other people. Okay. It was, well, it still. was pretty cool. <laughs> it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. Um, and so um, we talked, we were talking about trauma before too. And, you know, you can look for some signs and some of the signs for preschool children is like the fear of being separated from the parents or caregivers. If they cry or scream a lot, if they start eating poorly, maybe losing weight, having a lot of nightmares, then there's something going on and, and it needs to be addressed. I worked with one girl who really thought someone was sleeping under her bed all the time was going to kill her, you know, um, and it was really, um, her dad traveled a lot. So there was a, uh -huh. it was a safety issue. It was just a safety issue for her. And then elementary school kids, you know, they become anxious, fearful. They might feel guilty or a lot of shame, maybe have a hard time concentrating. Again, sleep. Sleep is a really good sign that there's an issue. And when it gets to middle school and high school, it's the depression, feeling alone, eating disorders, the self-harm behaviors, you know, mm -hmm. abusing alcohol or drugs, anything addicted related. It's a sign of, of low self-esteem or low self-worth. Um, maybe becoming involved in some risky sexual behavior, that sort of thing. So those are the signs that, okay, there's an issue here, you know, that I need to address. And again, I think we as parents have to address our own issues in order to not project those onto our children, but also to be able to recognize the issues in our kids. So and I want to wrap help. up with, a, with mm -hmm. the, yeah, I want to wrap up with the final thing too, about the words we use, because this is really important to me. And um, going all the way back to the beginning of the show, when I talked mm -hmm. about, um, uh, this, this person is on Toronto. Her name is Dr. Yvonne Oswald, and she's a master hypnosis and NLP practitioner. I think one of the best in the world. And she wrote a book called Every Word Has Power. And um, she teaches a lot about words and the words we use and how they have such a imp big impact. And there's been quite a lot of research about this too. And all the way back to like 5000 um, BC, uh, Lei Tzu, you know, a Chinese philosopher, mm -hmm. said, watch your thoughts, they become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your character. Your character becomes your destiny. So it really boils down to thoughts and words. And when we think about the words we use, there are many words that are considered low energy words versus high energy words. And the high energy words are uplifting, build self-worth and self-esteem. So I'll give you a few examples. So a low energy word would be hard, uh, bad, uh, difficult. So now you got to kind of understand the subconscious mind and how it works here. And the subconscious mind runs all of our habits and behaviors, and it also has no negative processing. So it can't look for what's not there. 
So if Hmm. I say, do not think of a pink elephant, do not think of a pink elephant. If I have everybody close their eyes in the room and I repeat that over and over again, most people are thinking of the pink elephant (laughs) because what comes after the not, right, is what they're thinking of because that's Mm -hmm. the emphasis. So um, hard. So if you're a parent and you maybe are trying to help your child with their homework, you're like, oh, that looks hard. Right away, boom, the child thinks, ooh, this is hard. Now that can have two different things. Some kids like the fight. But other kids, oh my God, they give up right away. So you could say instead, oh, that doesn't look so easy. You know, and the same, you could use the same word for difficult. Oh, this is really for you. You could say, oh, I'm finding this really difficult right now. Yeah, as a parent, you're just talking to somebody else. So that your child picks up, oh, this is difficult. This is difficult. And you might have a toddler around saying, I'm finding this parenting very difficult. They pick that up. Mm -hmm. So instead you say, oh, I just find this not so easy. Because easy is the better word. And that's what gets lodged in the subconscious. And you go ahead. Wow. I, I had a hard time wrapping my head around this one when you're saying it because, and then I started practicing it. And once you practice, it becomes a little bit easier, but then there's, you catch yourself saying something else. Oh, wait, wait, I'm going to put a positive spin on that. I need to say that in a different way. Um, I think it's a, a habits that we've fallen into, right? That we just, we just have to break and be aware of. Uh, that's very Absolutely. interesting. And, wh- and I also want to jump in on what you said about you know, even if our kids are in the other room or in the backyard and we're on the telephone, they are hearing us. They are taking those things in, um, especially before the age of eight, I believe was what the research is saying. So, wow, <laughs> there's just so much. I feel like I'm, you know, I don't want to walk on pin, on um, eggs and what's a walking on eggshells is the expression. Right. But, yeah. but, you know, like you take one thing from today, I would say listeners, if you can take one thing and, you know, it sparks your curiosity and wants you to look into it further or, the, or you say, ah, that's something I can try to change in my own life. That's a first step. That's a baby step. I would never suggest to anyone. And I knew this, you know, in my brain tumor recovery after my cranial it, baby steps it add up to huge, huge, um, enormous celebrations over time. So we just encourage you to take, and we're we're not done yet, a little bit more to talk about here with Annette, but there's so many things under this umbrella of children's emotional well-being, which comes back to us and the examples that we set, right? So um, that subconscious is what runs all of our habits and behaviors, right? Yeah. And words are really important, actually. And we don't, we don't realize um, we, when our children are so small that they're really taking in everything. And I had um, another person who was saying that their father had passed away suddenly. Um, the child was sleeping in the the room of his of his parents. The dad was passed away in the hospital, but the mother got the call. I, they had a lot of kids, so she wasn't at the hospital. Anyway, long story short, he heard the mother say, oh, my God, how am I going to take care of my son? And he took it as he was a burden, and he never wanted to be a burden after that. Oh, so that it, it it spiraled into all sorts of different things, but uh, which I won't go into, but it's amazing. And it was just a small thing. And he was, I think he was seven years old, you know, but imagine a seven-year-old thinking that they're a burden and she was saying it honestly, you know, of I mean, course she was in the mo- a moment of news. despair. Like, oh my gosh. Uh, of course, of course. Uh, so, you know, words have an impact and there are better ways to say negative things. We can say them with the positive takes a little bit longer. Even the word, but, you know, get the word, but out of your vocabulary, use the word and, because there's always a negative that comes behind it. But if you use the word and, you have to say the negative and the positive. Your language gets longer though. Like your sentences become much longer and people don't speak this way because I think our society is very risk adverse. uh, Business is risk adverse. So we talk in a more sort of negative risk oriented fashion. Can you give us an example? Give us an example of the on the spot well, same. of a sentence that ahead. we would normally use, but with, um, I was going to go out for a walk, um, but it's raining today. That's not a very good example. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, no, no. Um, okay. Um, I see you, you cleaned up the dishes after dinner, but you left all the crumbs here. You didn't sweep the floor and you didn't put the dishes away. Oh, okay. Small small example. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you could say, I, I, I see you cleared the the table. You did a great job. And there's a few things here that still need to be finished up. So the floor still needs to be swept and you should probably put the dishes up in the cupboard. Oh, what a great example. <laughs> Fantastic. Simple. 
<laughs> it's simple, oh. right? It's simple. But the emphasis is different. The emphasis is different. It sure is. It changes the entire message that they take in from not one of defeat to one of, oh, I just have to do something else. <laughs> learn. It, oh, it I love lets it. them learn. It lets them learn. Yeah. Yeah. Simple oh. things like that. Okay. Annette, I need to ask you about sophrology. Help us understand what this is all about. Uh, it's not the same thing as Reiki. It's very different. Oh, no, no, very yeah. different. No. So Explain. sophrology is more, um, sometimes people call it the dynamic cousin to mindfulness, but it's yeah. very different from mindfulness. It has um, sort of um, six six pillars, but it's the study of consciousness at peace. In a nutshell, that's what it is. It was developed in the 1960s by a neuropsychiatrist and became more popular in Switzerland and France um, after a dentist started using it with his tennis team and his dental patients, believe it or not. <laughs> and they got he had such success with his tennis team that the Swiss ski team started using it to help improve their performance. And they won more medals than they'd ever won before when they started using the sophrology technique. Then it spilled over into birthing and a lot of different things. But Casado originally used it to get people who had mental disorders off their medication. So schizophrenics, bipolar. Oh. So it can be used at a really deep level. Most sophrologists don't work at that level, but we work on um, the level of building confidence, building self-esteem, helping uh, birthing events, um, people get over fear, pain management. It's great for that as well. If you're doing professional development, if you have limiting beliefs, helps us move forward in that. So um, if people want to learn more, they should really just go to my website and read what is sophrology. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not an easy thing to describe in, in just a few minutes. And I know we only have a few minutes left, I think. Well, any link to mindfulness is to me extremely powerful. And if we could be doing this with our children before, uh, you know, at a very young age, imagine, you know, what we can equip with them with for life. Okay, Annette, I'm sure our listeners want to reach out to you. Where can they find you? Well, they can find me in a few places. So my website is www.trulybalance.com. Mm. So it's trulybalance.com. They can find me on Instagram on Truly Balance. They can find me on LinkedIn. It's at Annette Ebbinghouse. Um, on Facebook is also Truly Balance. Um, I have a newsletter if they would like to subscribe to that as well. I send out all sorts of interesting things. I have parenting workshops coming up in June as well, if they would like to join those. I have them running at different times. So um, yeah, I'd love to hear from them. And it's one of my passions is to help people on their journey to um, being uh, more wealthy through health. But the mental health, the emotional and the mental is quite important to me. So it's helping people in that regard. Oh, I, I'm just, there's just so many things I'd love to follow. Well, you and I will, <laughs> because we can chat yes. with each other at any time, but you know, and that is totally reachable. She's over in Switzerland. So whatever your time zone is, but uh, go to her website, um, check it out. Um, take one or two tidbit, uh, tidbits or even more today. And, you know, maybe start a conversation with someone in your own home about how things might change and look in that mirror. So Annette, I thank you very much for being our guest. Uh, your insights have truly been amazing. Well, thank you, Lynn. It's really, it's been a pleasure to be here and to discuss this really important topic with you. I appreciate it. Really, it. really is quite important. And yeah, we have, um, you know, the WHO came out saying that um, this was a while back, but it still, still applies that 25% of long-term mental illness starts before the age of 14, 75% mm -hmm. by the age of 21. So it's really something we have to start considering. And it's really on the rise. It's um, especially after COVID. It's, uh, I see, sure I've done a lot of work with youth after COVID and um, it really had quite a big impact on certain age groups. Absolutely. I have a, a guest coming in a few weeks and we're going to talk about that comfort zone that we created because of COVID, but so many of us are still stuck in and how do we get out of that comfort zone? Uh, I do want to introduce next show. week's guest, uh, Danielle Bettman. She's the powerhouse parenting coach for parents of strong-willed kids and she'll be joining us to take the helm. She's also the host of the well-loved podcast called Failing Motherhood. And uh, it's taken a little time to figure out uh, what my closing statement is going to be at the end of every episode, but here it is. I'd love your feedback. Let's look in the mirror so we can inspire and, uh, and empower our children so that they have what they need for the ups and downs of life. And answer to the trivia question at the beginning of the podcast, it's Kingsville, Ontario, the most Southern town in Canada. We'll see you next time. 
Thanks for tuning into today's episode of Taking the Helm. We hope that Lynn and her guests have provided valuable insights on how to create a safe emotional space for your children that empowers them to be their best selves. Until we talk again, have a wonderful week.